Welcome to Exhibition. And hello, Charmaine Pike. Hi, Richard. Great to see you again. Uh, and your exhibition is Rituals of the Herd at Defiance Gallery in Sydney. For many years, you have uh, developed a, a particular uh, rocky landscape, shall we call it, with, with strong shapes. How did those rock landscapes come to develop over the years? Um, I think predominantly, I'd have to say that from childhood and all the traveling that we did with horses, I traveled through quite extensively through New South Wales and Victoria. So it was sort of an imprint on me as a young child. I was always in quite, quite awestruck by mountain forms and rock formations back then. And I was just starting to get an inkling of, you know, the beauty of nature and, and how insignificant you could feel, one can feel amidst such monolithic structures. And I've just always been drawn to them. Even though I wasn't drawing them back then, I think that that has to have over time evolved in the work. They have become so characteristic over the years that uh, I know sometimes um, uh, in travels with other artists, people have pointed to particular rocks and said, yeah. that's a Charmaine Pike rock. <laughs> So yeah, I, I'm, I wondering, <laughs> I'm wondering partly, you know, whether they are landscapes of your mind as well as of the memory. Oh, definitely both, I would say. It's very complex in my head because I, I definitely am drawn to those rock formations I see in real life, but it's, there's definitely a psychological angle. And as you said, with the going off to residencies, in fact, I did one with you, um, in amidst the crew in 2011. And that was my very first artist residency where I actually started to work plein air from the, directly from the landscape, didn't know what I was doing, but um, 20 years earlier, I'd, I mean, I'd done 20 years mm. worth of weird, odd shapes that were more about horse parts and body parts. And then suddenly I was in the landscape and they developed a little bit more from there into what people were saying were rock formations. Mm. Uh, so that's kind of stuck, but I feel like this, as you say, this, this exhibition has evolved from that as well. You mentioned going back a, a decade or so uh, to the, the rock formations. That visual language has been very clearly yours now for many years. Um, and this exhibition is true to that. But the exciting thing is it seems to be a very considerable evolution. Is that how it feels to you? Um, look, I hope so. That I guess as artists, that, that's what we're trying to achieve, I would imagine. We're always trying to push forwards and evolve in our work and not be repeating the same things. But obviously, I hope there's continuity in the work. But I definitely feel like the, this work, you know, I think I did look backwards in order to move forwards with my work. And you can see that these, these forms are more abstracted and less about a rock formation as such. Mm. That was very much the comment that I was going to make, that they appear to be moving more and more towards an abstracted landscape. Some of the marks on the surfaces of what might be rocks um, are very graphic marks. Mm. Does it feel as though you are going more and more to the abstract essence? Um, not, it wasn't a conscious decision to move towards abstraction. I think what happened is that through doing loads and loads of drawing as preparation for this show more than ever I, I drew before I got into the studio and painted I think the mark making evolved further from the, all the texture drawings I learned a lot about color and line and and being I'm quite brave with drawing as opposed to painting and I think that I was developing new ways of seeing and mark making well fortunately that bravery is uh, very much on display because a large number of the drawn works that you refer to, particularly with texture colour, are part of this exhibition. Um, how do you decide to use uh, the materials in your drawing, particularly I'm thinking about texture colour? Oh, well, firstly, they're very childlike, um, I guess. Um, and as a child, I was fortunate enough to be given you know, ample amounts of textures and drawings and paper and sat in a corner and 
you know, I was a fairly anxious child, so there, there was a safety and a, a joy in just sitting, sitting alone and, and drawing and drawing and drawing. So I, uh, I've kept that up, but it wasn't until I went on a China residency in 2016, I think it was, and I bought, so I bought myself some quality te textures, coloured markers, mm. and I just started to slowly work more in texture, and I, they were always going to be a personal thing. I wasn't ever intending on showing them, but I showed Lauren, and she, she really appreciated them, so we decided to show them. So, yeah, and I just love... I, I'm a little ADHD, and I love the sound that textures make, that sound and much to my partner's horror but it's very soothing it's very soothing perhaps that would be something that uh, people looking at the works or perhaps acquiring the works might be able to imagine is mm -hmm. as they look at those repeated apparent marks because you can see the marks uh, on yeah. the on the drawings they can actually imagine the repeated sound <laughs> that those marks <laughs> signify yeah 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 we either love it or hate it i think do you make any significant distinction between drawing and painting in your practice? Uh, look, yeah, yes and no. I think ultimately it's all drawing, uh, whether it be with the brush or other mediums. It's all drawing for me, but I guess, again, in um, just repeating the same thing, I... I have drawn most of my life and it's been due to the accessibility of drawing and, you know, it's immediate, the immediacy of drawing. As I said, I'm, I'm a little bit more bold and braver in my drawing um, than I am in my painting. But I think, you know, because I'm drawn to the line and mark making it, it's all drawing to me. These paintings uh, seem very bold though. Um, and let's turn to some of them uh, in just a moment. But first of all, I did want to ask you about the title of the exhibition, Rituals of the Herd. Can you give us an insight into that title? Um, yeah, a little. Uh, look, it's deeply personal, but just to, just to give you an oversight, it's Rituals of the Herd. I stumbled across it in an old Rolling Stone magazine, and it was an article written by a Watergate figure called John Dean. And uh, it was illustrated by Ralph Steadman. Now, that has nothing to do with why I chose the title, but Rituals of the Herd, my, you know, um, dedication to constantly reading about the human condition. And uh, I thought Rituals of the Herd described us quite well. <laughs> and because, I, you know, also because of a lot of these land forms that I do or forms are personified. You know, I'm, I'm acting out a lot of human qualities in these paintings as well. As we turn to uh, some of these painted works now, um, perhaps we can refer to them by title uh, and, and get a little bit of a sense uh, of where those titles have come from, because they all, one way or another, seem to, to have fascinating uh, elements to them. Uh, for example, Drexia signalling, uh, I suspect is to do with a band. Yes, yes. Um, that's amazing that you know that. Um, I, my partner has an incredible record collection, so often I'll be drawing upstairs or doing small paintings to his music collection. And I simply love, I, I really need music in order to paint and draw. I just love that to be around me. And he introduced me to this band called Drexia. And their whole concept is that they're, and they live under, under the sea. And they have their own, you know, their whole concept in their band is that they are, you know, a living organism under the sea. And I just felt that I, it, look, it, it's apparent if you, if you go into what I've been reading lately, it's very connected. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do, uh, you do uh, read very broadly and deeply, I know, uh, about art, about poetry, about a range of other uh, topics. How much do those ideas in your reading inform your paintings and drawings? Oh, I think they're incredibly uh, meaningful. I think the whole, I, I read voraciously, as you know, and, I, and I'm from a lot of genres. And I, I guess in particular, you know, I've read a lot of Western philosophers and, um, you know, some of my favourite 
I guess, genres of the, you know, I love the existentialists and I love the theatre of the absurd, Antony Nato, anything really strange. And as you know, sci-fi is, uh, especially of the post-apocalyptic, unpeopled landscape type, really like that. But in the last few years, uh, I went through a period of being very unwell and I decided that I would start to look at Eastern philosophy. And oh, now I'm, I'm a neophyte to esoteric writings. So I've moved off into this other direction and it's very spiritual and very, oh, it, oh, fascinating, fascinating. So it's all tying into these titles and I have gotten some of the titles from the books I've been reading or, you know, some of the quotes. Well, for example, if we, uh, if we look at a number of the titles, they do seem to have either um, cosmic or, or um, esoteric references. Uh, tell us a little about Return of the Archons. Uh, <laughs> Well, um, that was just a, now where did I see that? Return of the, oh, I know. That was actually another thing I've been getting right into, which has definitely had, a, had an impact on this show, is 60s Star Trek. I'd ah. never watched it before. And there's an episode recently we watched called, the, called exactly that, The Return of the Archons. And it was because, simply that. Because the, the Archons were in esoteric uh, philosophy, were they not the builders of the universe? Yes, yes, that's right. And so I, I guess I researched the archons and yeah, I could just tie that in in my mind in, in terms of what I'd been reading and researching. Um, I'm not sure whether we're back with philosophy or Star Trek, but <laughs> riddles of the universe. Oh, riddles of the universe. Yeah, I might have made that one up. <laughs> um, I have been, you know, I've been looking, studying a lot of about the multiverse out there. And I mean, as artists, I think, I would think that we're all wondering about existence. And, you know, I ask myself these questions all the time. Why are we here and what is here? So my reading has evolved into starting to read more science books, uh, physics, neuroscience. And I guess I'm getting a lot of that kind of terminology from there and, and trying to sort of put that into the weirdness of the work and the oddities of the, the worlds I'm creating in these works. And with a title like Best Be Still, Best Be Empty, that sounds to me like a, a, a line of poetry or a line from literature somewhere. Lao Tzu, I believe. Lao Tzu. So yeah. some, some Eastern philosophy. Yes, yeah, yeah. Definitely. And I thought that it kind of went with that work. I felt, even though, you know, people are saying it's got a lot of energy in it, but those solid forms, I outlined them and they're not filled in. So that's a little bit different to the other work. And perhaps a, a final title, because I, I think you use it twice, uh, you know, number one and number two, um, Habitat Negative. Yeah, Habitat Negative from memory is another song title. Right. Possibly from Alexia. If any, anyway, regardless of that, I felt very, um, it resonated with me on a lot of levels and particularly echoing the state of the environment. And, you know, I recently read um, a lot of stuff, you know, that David Attenborough was saying. So, you know, I felt quite negative about the planet. So that's where that came from. In terms of influence uh, over the years, you've been talking about some of the some of the reading and and uh, some of the thought provoking material that's informed the work. But how important have mentors and other artist colleagues been to you and and the development of your practice? Um, yeah, incredibly so. I've had a really good run with teachers. I you know just from way back in high school when, you know, one teacher stood out and happened to be an art teacher who saw something in me that was worth uh, nurturing to then off to TAFE in the country in Tamworth, studying for three years there under such um, incredible artists such as Ross Laurie, Angus Niverson, um, printmaker uh, Bill Kensel, then on to Kofa and having Ian Grant, Idris Murphy, and my fa all time favorite teacher, Mike Essen. Um, and I've remained friends with Angus Niverson. I've traveled with him um, extensively. And he's such an important figure in my life. He's a very good mentor and friend. And other friends, other artists, I rely on 
for the support. We all ring each other and have nervous breakdowns about shows and it's just a rapport, a good rapport I have with a lovely crew. And it's important, I think it's invaluable. Tell us something about the, uh, the, the practicalities of you at work creating work. Um, when it comes to the, uh, the paintings, how, they're very robust in their forms and, and their style, and it would seem the application of the paint. How, how does it feel while you're actually painting? I feel like a train wreck. I feel, I feel a lot of things when I'm painting, but I, I, I guess there is a bit of energy. I do have music going and there is a physical, you know, a bit of dancing about and, I, and it does feel very physical when I'm applying the paint. And especially when I start out, I have no fear of the blank canvas. And I'm very bold at that point. It's just a little bit later on when it becomes tougher. And then I start to disappear from the studio a little bit. So my work becomes very sporadic. Um, at that point. You mentioned time in the landscape, uh, painting or drawing plein air, and also time in the studio. How do you divide those times and do you work very differently in those two environments? Oh, I think I do work differently. I, I do seem, when I go on art trips and I do try to do them as much as possible, I'm re-energised, definitely re-energised, and the work is telling from that. And I get new information and especially if you return to the same places it's really lovely to be able to get into the landscape again with new eyes and and try and learning to see you're always learning to see um, whereas in the studio it's coming from my head and my heart and uh it's all you know i'm all over the place when i'm initially starting you know i'm not working from photographs and i don't do a preliminary sketch I just start, so they do have a bit of a different quality. Probably less, less literal than what I do plan airing. We spoke a little earlier about uh, how this particular exhibition is an evolutionary step from work previously. It may be premature to ask uh, at, at this stage, but as that evolution is happening, do you have a sense of, of where the next trajectory may be? I might go larger. I think. I'm, I'm enjoying the sizes of the works, the larger ones in particular, and getting some lovely feedback from, for those. So I think that that's what I'd probably concentrate on, and even perhaps trying to do some bigger texture drawings. Uh, that's, that's about all I know from now. I don't know what's going to happen. Well, we never know what's going to happen, but we can <laughs> look forward to it, and we do. Charmaine Pike, thanks very much for sharing your exhibition with us. Thank you so much, Richard.